Alors, bienvenue à, à tout le monde à la saison 2021 de l'Orchestre de la francophonie. C'est notre 20e saison. Et bienvenue à la série Invités de Marc. Notre invité aujourd'hui est Adrian Anantawan. Nous sommes ravis que M. Anantawan soit avec nous aujourd'hui. Alors, merci à vous. Alors, Adrian Anantawan est un violoniste soliste euh, canadien et professeur à la Milton Academy et au Tanglewood Institute de l'Université de Boston. Il est diplômé du Curtis Institute of Music de l'Université Yale et de la Harvard Graduate School of Education. Il a étudié avec Isaac Perlman, Pinchas Zuckerman et Anne-Sophie Mouta. Il s'est souvent produit en tant que de soliste avec de nombreux orchestres du Canada et a également présenté des récitals lors du Aspen Music Festival et au Will Recital Hall à Carnegie Hall. Adrian a aidé à créer l'initiative de musique de chambre virtuelle de Holland uh, Bloor View Kids Rehab Center. Ce projet collaboratif rassemble des chercheurs, des musiciens, des médecins et des éducateurs pour développer des instruments de musique adaptatifs pouvant être joués par des jeunes ayant un handicap. Adrian est également le fondateur du Music Inclusion Program qui vise à faire apprendre la musique instrumentale aux enfants ayant un handicap. Il est président du département de musique à la Milton Academy et membre du corps professoral du Tanglewood Institute de l'Université de Boston. Adrian continue de défendre le handicap et les arts. Aujourd'hui, le titre de sa présentation est « La musique et la revendication citoyenne ». Welcome to the 2021 2021 season of the Orchestre de la Francophonie is the 20th season and welcome to the series special guest presentations. Our guest today is Adrian Anantawan. We are delighted to have Mr. Anantawan with us today, so thanks to you. Adrian Anantawan is a Canadian violin soloist and professor at the Milton Academy and at the Boston University Tanglewood Institute. Adrian holds degrees from the Curtis Institute of Music, Yale University, and Harvard Graduate School of Education. He has studied with Isaac Perlman, Minchas Zuckerman, and Anne-Sophie Mouta. He has performed extensively as a soloist with many of Can Canada's orchestras, and has also fe present presented feature re recitals at the Aspen Music Festival and Whale Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall. Adrian helped to create the virtual chamber music initiative at the Holland Bloorview Kids Rehab Center. This cross collaborative project brings researchers, musicians, doctors, and educators together to develop adapt adaptive musical instruments capable of being played by young people with disabilities. Adrian is also the founder of the Music Inclusion Program, aimed at having children with disabilities learn instrumental music with their typical peers. Currently chair of music at M Milton Academy and on the faculty of Boston University Tanglewood Institute, Adrian continues to advocate for disability and the arts. So today, the title of his presentation is Music, Advocacy and Citizenship. Avant de débuter la présentation, l'Orchestre de la francophonie voudrait remercier ses partenaires financiers. L'OF reconnaît l'appui du gouvernement du Canada et d'Emploi Québec et de Montréal. L'OF remercie ses commanditaires Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie les fondations suivantes. RBC Foundation, Fondation CBAS, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse musicale du Canada et la Zeller Family Foundation. Before we start the presentation, the Orchestre de la Francophonie would like to thank their financial partners. Uh, L'OF acknowledges the Government of Canada's support and Emploi Québec, Ile de Montréal. The OF would like to thank their private sponsors, Canimex and Panorama Media. And the OF would like to thank the following foundations, RBC Foundation, Fondation CBAS, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et and the Zeller Family Foundation. La programmation complète est disponible sur le lien de la page d'accueil de Facebook. Vous cliquez sur l'onglet Plus et Événements. You can follow us and have access to the full 
program on Facebook. And also you can uh, see all the events uh, that are um, that will, will happen until the end of August and uh, on the YouTube channel. Donc, vous pouvez aussi avoir accès à toutes les activités sur euh, la chaîne YouTube de l'OF. Et vous pouvez nous suivre sur euh, Twitter, at, at OF-2021, euh, on Twitter, at OF-2021, and on Instagram also. Alors, les élèves pourront poser des questions à la fin de la présentation. Euh, le public peut aussi poser des questions en, en allant sur le Zoom. Euh, il y a un, un petit onglet qui est Q&A, écrire les questions, puis on va, euh, Adrian va se faire un plaisir de vous répondre. So the student can ask questions at the end of the presentation and the public can, can also ask questions. So for the public, you go on the Q&A button and write your questions and Adrian will uh, be delighted to answer your question. Alors, merci et bonne présentation. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. All right. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Mm -hmm. And hello from Toronto, Canada. It has just gotten sunny out here after a few days of rain. So it's lovely to be able to connect with you in, in this spirit. And please uh, let me know in the chat if you have any questions, even during the presentation. I am happy to incorporate that uh, in and out as I sort of talk a little bit about uh, the origins uh, of my life and uh, my development as a professional musician, just like a lot of you are, are doing right now, and, and talk a little bit about the future and, and where we might stand in terms of the intersections of social justice, classical music, and uh, various identities like disability. But uh, like a lot of presentations, I thought it would be just nice to be able to, to play a little bit of music for you and embrace this sunshine uh, and sunshine in E major. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna play uh, maybe three movements of, of the uh, Bach Partita number three. So a couple middle ones, Lore, Gavant and Rondo, and then just finish it up with uh, a little jig at the end to just get us all into the spirit. And um, you're welcome just to close your eyes or, or just listen and, and enjoy the music. Uh, so I am very pleased and honored to be able to play even in the Zoom space. Uh, so thank you in advance.
little mini concert for you and it's just nice to be able to find space with my instrument I know that a lot of you are sort of engaged in in this uh, program right now and and finding some joy uh, with your instruments and, and I can't wait personally to be able to like play in person and live and with other people uh, relatively soon and I hope that uh, you're feeling that same energy so I really appreciate you uh, listening through this 2D uh, box. And at the same time, I think it really speaks to the way that uh, music can really transcend barriers uh, via you know, this digital stream, uh, going up to a satellite, back down to wherever you are in your uh, room or space, uh, to being able to uh, think about the barriers of time, to play a piece by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, from you know, hundreds of years ago and pre-pandemic, although there are a lot of pandemics you know, before then too, it really just connects us to this larger uh, common framework of humanity. And I think it's really important to, to start with that too, because I think that what we have as a gift uh, as being musicians is uh, the idea of being able to transcend boundaries. Uh, and, and thinking about that transcendence in a way that moves human prog uh, progress forward. I know that that can be sometimes a little bit challenging as a classical musician because we're always looking towards the past and sort of like this uh, almost like museum artifact of, of like Bach or Mozart or anything else that you're playing. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, we make it our own and, and we, uh, use our stories to be able to inform uh, a piece of music and an interpretation that allows us to share the unique and, and the best of ourselves. So I'm hoping that I can share a little bit of my personal story uh, and, and hopefully just find ways that I can connect to you in ways that uh, you might be able to see your music uh, and your practice uh, moving forward because it is so important. Uh, to be able to engage in arts and culture. And, and I know that as young musicians, uh, it can be a real challenge, uh, especially in these times where uh, we see, uh, you know, COVID-19, uh, racism, and a whole host of, of, of problems that are uh, facing us, not only now, but into the future. And where does music and where does the arts sort of play uh, in uh, being able to uh, address those problems or solve them or, or just allow us to find meaning in them. So I'm going to start uh, all the way to the back and I'm going to uh, start sharing a uh, Prezi uh, presentation here. Uh, you'll probably want to flip the title screen and then I'll go to uh, values and beliefs. Uh, so I'm not sure if people or folks notice because we are sort of in this Zoom box, <laughs> but I'm actually missing my right hand. Uh, so the doctors theorized that an umbilical cord had wrapped around uh, my arm when I was uh, still in my mother's womb. 
and I can actually sort of show you up close since uh, we are on this webcam. So I can't move my wrist very much. I still have five fingers right here, but they don't really do much. Uh, my elbow is fully functional. Uh, and of course my, my uh, shoulder, which you probably saw engaged a lot in my playing is uh, definitely uh, functioning well. So uh, I think that when I was first born, it was definitely something that my parents were not prepared for. And I think that there was also, you know, in their brains and, and a lot of people, just this monolith of what the word disability means. Uh, all of a sudden, they're presented with a baby who is missing a hand and, you know, his parents sort of see their, their children for the first time, they sort of see their entire lives, their child's lives flash uh, in front of them. And I think my parents were always uh, concerned from the get-go of how I would integrate within society, if I would be able to have friends, if I would be able to make meaningful connections, because on the outside, at least, there was a, a very visible disability that set me apart uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, my mom in particular was a little bit scared of presenting me to my grandmother, uh, who's on the left of this slide. And the reason why is in a lot of cultures, but I come from a Thai and, and Chinese background. Uh, my mom is from Hong Kong. Uh, in the Chinese culture in particular, there is a, a superstition about disability uh, and, and in certain folk traditions, not every Chinese person believes this, but just, you know, it's a very old school way of thinking. But disability can be seen as some type of curse upon the family. And that if I was missing an arm, it was as, you know, the gods were uh, creating retribution for uh, past sins of, of previous generations. And uh, I think my mom was a little concerned or just didn't really know where my grandmother really sort of fit uh, within that sort of set of belief systems. And uh, I flew over uh, to Hong Kong and uh, I was just as little as you saw me uh, right there on, on the left. My grandmother took one look at me and she said, you know what, there's nothing wrong with him. He's quite ordinary actually. <laughs> he cries like any baby. He laughs like any baby. Uh, I think that he'll definitely need sort of, you know, some strength training and exercise on his small hand. And that was pretty much it. So she went to the marketplace in Hong Kong and uh, I actually have it here, uh, got a bracelet for me and I can actually show it up in the uh, webcam. It's a silver bracelet. And then there are two sort of like pumpkin like uh, attachments to that you, uh, jingle it, it actually makes a, a nice uh, soothing or pleasant rattling sound. So when I was in the crib, so I've been told, you know, I'm flailing around, moving all my limbs and everything. My grandmother mother puts this um, uh, lovely bracelet on my small hand. And all of a sudden, you know, moving everything, legs and feet. And if I shook my small hand here, I would be so fascinated by the sound that I would just work out my biceps. And I just kept on doing this for hours a day. Uh, so in, in many ways, as much as I like to say that uh, the violin is um, my native instrument, if you can call it that, uh, this little tiny bracelet here uh, was probably my first uh, musical instrument. And, uh, and it just sort of set me off on, on the right path, I think. Uh, so when we talk about values and beliefs uh, from my family, they didn't see necessarily what I was missing, but the complete human. And when you interface that with music, uh, you can be utterly missing something on the outside, but still being complete within your spirit, within your soul. And that's what people um, will feel and, and eventually sort of uh, see as your being or, or character. Uh, and I'm very lucky uh, to have been able to engage uh, in this work and, and this practice uh, because I think I had very supportive uh, family members uh, who sort of started me off literally um, from the very beginning at birth as a musician in some way. 
So I thought I would play a, a quick piece of music. Uh, this is from the Butterfly Lovers Concerto. This is one of my uh, favorites. And I always like to bring it to the space after I tell this story because um, my uh, grandmother, uh, that was her favorite song. She actually came to Canada uh, when I was a teenager. And this is probably uh, now 15 years ago. And uh, she uh, had dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, the one piece that she did recognize that I could play um, was this, this little excerpt uh, that I really think is, is uh, really a tribute to her spirit and her belief. And uh, for those who don't know, the Butterfly Love Concerto is all about transformation and, and thinking about how we ascend uh, past uh, what might be the current challenges uh, on this planet uh, in a way to transform into butterflies, which is a, an apt metaphor. <laughs> Uh, that I would love to be able to share with you right now. Thank you for letting me share that with you. I think it's a really lovely uh, piece that is very meaningful to me and my family. So I really appreciate that. Uh, so I started uh, playing the violin uh, when I was 10 years old, but uh, it was actually never really a predestined thing. Um, so our music teacher at the time, I was uh, in elementary school, 10 years old and I remember like there was like uh, a music teacher who basically said, hey, we're going to now start learning to play a musical instrument. And she had like this big you know, box uh, full of instruments that we were going to have this mystery reveal. And I was 
so excited because I just loved music and, and I really wanted to play a musical instrument. So I remember the teacher opened up the box and I looked inside and it was the recorder. And uh, I think that at first I was like, okay, well, we'll sort of see what happens. And then I took it out and then realized that there were too many holes uh, in that recorder for me to actually play all the notes. Uh, so my heart sank and I was like, well, what am I gonna do? I asked my teacher and she said, well, you can uh, be a composer, you can, uh, be the professional audience. <laughs> like, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, even as a 10 year old. So luckily my parents agreed with me and we started looking for uh, different options, but just to sort of reflect upon that early experience, I wasn't necessarily um, disabled in the sense that like I couldn't, or I, that was my identity and that was who I was. It was this construct that was created by my environment that uh, was disabling in some way, because if she had chosen another instrument, maybe the trumpet, for instance, that might've been a bit easier uh, for me to, to take a look at. So my parents actually did uh, sort of experiment and said, hey, why don't we try the trumpet? And uh, it wasn't for me. I, I think that uh, it just wasn't a sound quality that I really identified with. Um, and, uh, you know, early on, it, it's very loud. <laughs> and I don't think my parents uh, really appreciated that either. So uh, my dad said, okay, well, you know, if we want to save money, let's, uh, let's have you sing. And I tried singing. I did not have a great voice. Still don't. I try my best, but not great. Uh, and I was ready to sort of give up on the entire sort of thing and just like, you know, pursue other types of interests like sports when I was watching Sesame Street, uh, and I'm gonna actually share the clip right here uh, and sort of show you what I saw uh, when I was a young kid. It'll be pretty self-explanatory. You know, some things that are really easy for you are real hard for me. Yeah, but some things are easy for you that are hard for me. So that's a great clip and look at that. So it looks like Carlman's back on Sesame Street. <laughs> I'm not sure what he's doing for the latest clip, but uh, I'll, I'll watch it at some point. Uh, I love the sort of like, you know, the early um, sort of late eighties Perlman with the, the mutton chops <laughs> for the, the sideburns. Uh, the, the little girl who's like, yeah, some things that are hard for me. And she's like, just playing beautifully in tune, legato sounded, I don't know how old she is. But those points were not sort of um, important to me at that point in life. Uh, it was actually more just like seeing someone with a visible disability walk up on stage with crutches. Um, and then he puts those crutches down, picks up an instrument, and then his identity completely changes. And just like I was saying, uh, disabling environments uh, you know, these stairs were definitely inaccessible for him in, in some capacity. Uh, and yet like he could do whatever he wanted in his imagination uh, with the violin. And, and that representation early on my life uh, made a, a tremendous impact, um, not only for uh, who he was as a person with a visible disability, but also just he was an incredible musician and all of a sudden I wanted to like watch every single clip by Ishaq Perlman that I could. Um, and I told my parents, okay, well, this is the uh, instrument that I want to play. And I'm sure that when my parents were sort of like 
when I was first born. Okay, he'll be able to do a lot of things. Maybe he'll become lawyer or, you know, he can do research. You know, maybe he won't be able to play the violin, but, you know, that's fine. <laughs> and lo and behold, that was like the one thing that I was like, I had my heart set on it. And I was like, I want to be like H.R. Perlman. Uh, and, and they uh, said, okay, it's drugged and we'll just sort of figure it out. So they got me a, a small instrument and it was very difficult actually to find um, uh, the correct teacher for me. Uh, we literally had to go door to door in, in Toronto to find someone because I think a lot of teachers, at least at that point, because they hadn't seen it done before, they're like, well, why don't you choose something else? That's number one. Number two, it's like, I don't want to disappoint this young person if like all he can do is, you know, uh, pluck open strings or something like that. And you sort of have a poor relationship with music moving forward. Um, there was one teacher in Mississauga who ended up uh, taking me on though, which is great. And she said, you know what? We won't even focus on the bow because I had no adaptation at this point. And uh, we'll just like, do something like conventional. We'll, we'll start off with left hand pizzicato uh, with all your pieces in Suzuki. And literally, this is what we would do. It's like, just... or and then uh, I think the next one was uh, Molto Perpetual. So it was definitely a strain on the pinky finger. I was already sort of going into like, you know, uh, multiple positions just to be able to uh, get all the notes. But I was just so happy to be playing a musical instrument uh, that I was completely happy to just settle for that alone. And I'll just be a left-hand pizzicato violinist for the rest of my life. Thank goodness that did not happen because there's limited repertoire. And... Uh, if we can go back to the slides and go to the next slide, I uh, ended up going to a children's rehabilitation center uh, to have this adaptation made. Uh, it's called Holland Blorview. They are based out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, back then, they were called the Human Millen Center, and uh, their goal was to be able to help children with disabilities from all across uh, all across Canada, actually, uh, to rehabilitate after accidents, to be able to engage in, in therapeutic uh, methods uh, of helping kids who are recovering from surgeries uh, or missing an arm or a leg, uh, just a whole host uh, of various health conditions that uh, Hall and you work with. And uh, within the uh, orthotics prosthetics department where I had a lot of other adaptations made, uh, my parents came with me and uh, you know showed the violin and it's like, oh, he can left hand pits already, which is great. Uh, but he needs something for the bow. And <laughs> the, the process literally was like, okay, it's never been done, but we just have to connect uh, the, the bow in some way. So after a lot of sort of uh, back and forth, and I'm going to actually show this uh, closer on the webcam so you can actually see it. Um, they came out with something called a spatula, and I'm going to deconstruct this for a sec and uh, take this off. Uh, you can see sort of from the side, there's like a little tongue that comes out here. And uh, it's just a plaster cast. It's pretty thin uh, and it's held together uh, via Velcro. So that's sort of like one side of it that I sort of fit onto my limb right here. And then another part of it is actually, I think the more interesting aspect of it is the uh, bow side of it. So I'm going to zoom up again. You can see this here. So as you all know, this um, nut uh, comes out uh, and the uh, frog comes off uh, for any bow, which is great because what they ended up doing was they deconstructed the bow, took it apart. They fit an uh, aluminum tube through it. And then essentially the engineer just welded uh, a bridge on top. This is sort of a more advanced version that's now 3D printed, but literally it was uh, something they, they created from scratch. and. Uh, and the materials were sort of funny too. So this little sticky part of the spatula here is actually the, the bottom of a rubber shoe uh, to keep the friction going. So what ends up happening is that slot right here fits and docks on to the adaptation. I have a 
piece of a putty here that I just sort of used to brace the uh, the impacts of the bone. I'm just going to put it on off camera for a sec. Uh, and essentially, it gives me uh, a way to be able to hold the bow. It's relatively lightweight, still using gravity and, and using my shoulder. Uh, some people have sort of uh, asked me sort of in retrospect, would it have been useful to have a wrist or all these other joints? And in some ways, you never know. I might still experiment and try to add things on. but. Uh, the amazing thing about the adaptation, I think this also implicates um, sort of violin technique is how little you actually need in order to uh, express a musical idea on the instrument, uh, which is great because I think that a lot of us sort of come through like years and years of technique and, and uh, nuance, like every single joint has to be accounted for on the bow hand, wrists and like arm weight. Uh, and we think so much about everything that needs to happen in order for us to uh, translate what's up here to the output of the instrument. And uh, essentially all I'm doing is just moving my shoulder back and forth and just varying speed and pressure. And of course, you know, there are some sort of more fancy things that I'm doing now uh, that are, uh, you know, over the fingerboard, under like closest to the bridge sort of deal. Uh, but my teacher at that point said that uh, for any musician, the most important appendages that you have are not your limbs, but your ears. And even then, when I think about it in retrospect, we have like percussion players like Ellen Glenny who are uh, hearing impaired and they still are able to make music. So really when you break it down, it's all about your imagination and co combining that with the will uh, to be able to want to produce something and then the technique follows uh, from there. So if I'm playing, I'm sort of gonna get a little geeky violin wise here. So I can never draw a straight bow. I have maybe about, uh, a third of the bow that's actually sort of usable in that sense. Uh, but most of the time, if I'm like near to the uh, tip of the bow, I'm going to be very crooked. It actually gets much more challenging at the G string versus the E string. The opposite is true for uh, the G string for the frog. I get very crooked um, when I go to the E string, for instance. Uh, but these days, uh, I'm very lucky to sort of use that in a way that uh, really, again, sort of just combines with sort of the idea of what, what you're wanting to produce. So say for instance, I wanted to sort of like have more flotando uh, sound and like a piece by Chrysler, I'm gonna hang out. You're to the tip of the bow most of the time in some ways, you know, typically people would probably start with a up, down, which sounds great, but what I'll do is something like down, 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 up. Just hang on. Maybe just the frog here. Sort of deal. And what ends up happening is at least from my perspective, and, and maybe this is something you can reflect upon too, uh, all of our bodies are slightly different. And when we're sort of creating sort of this individualized sound, we're going to have to approach it from completely different ways. So once you do have your, your foundations in place, uh, I would say that like almost all of the work in sort of that laboratory of your practice room uh, is is a place where it's not only exploring your imagination, but just understanding sort of your, the mechanics of your body uh, in a way that makes it as, um, <laughs> as healthy as possible uh, to be able to uh, produce these great sounds. <laughs> I'm getting a reminder, I, I feel bad. I, I turn off original sound, so I'll just play that clip one more time. It's always 
nice to play lick a couple times. <laughs> Original sound. Uh, I love Zoom. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> uh, thank you for your patience, all. Um, so I was very lucky. I, um, I felt like from like an identity uh, perspective that um, music was my thing because all of a sudden I was able to um, do something that wasn't about how I looked on the exterior. Because um, it, it happens, like even if I go out on the street today and I'm getting a cup of coffee, it'll be like, oh, what's your order? Look, look down at the hand, look back up, a little awkward. <laughs> it's like, it's fine for me now. But it's like, people will always see you, uh, at least in a split second, uh, about your exterior. And the amazing thing of, about uh, growing up with this instrument and like having this practice of, of becoming a musician was that I was able to uh, connect to people that made me feel essentially human. And, and that alone can create a type of motivation and, and light a fire that allows any human to like uh, want to tackle any challenge because it's not just about playing the notes, it's not about winning the competition, it's not about even getting the job, it's really just about expressing something that makes you feel connected to other people and to be able to change their minds sometimes about what the exterior might be uh, to expressing something that is internal and, and uh, in some ways even more authentic and, and real. So I practice a lot and um, did a lot of um, youth orchestras just like uh, you and and sort of just going through those levels, right? Uh, I was part of the National Youth Orchestra um, when I was a, a teenager, uh, going through all those excerpts and playing music. It was just great to be able to make friendships through the instrument. Uh, and at the same time, I wasn't necessarily completely sold that it was going to be something that I want to do with my, my life, uh, at least for, for a long time. Uh, so I remember, uh, my teacher saying, you know what, Adrian, you're getting to that age where you're 16 years old and you may as well start at least keeping your options open and uh, you should audition for Curtis because my, my uh, teacher in Toronto had been an alumni of that institution. I was like, okay, shrug, let's, let's do it and let's sort of see what happens. And uh, I was very low key and low pressure about it because this was supposed to be the practice run. <laughs> And I remember it's like uh, uh, being on the plane and still memorizing my music. And I was like, you know, uh... and listening and listening to that clip over and over again, Perlman, you know, sort of deals like, okay, got to get in my head, head got to make sure my fingers are going to do the right thing. And it's like, okay, this is, you know, not going to be something that will uh, really affect my future. And uh, I did the audition and a couple months later, the director of the uh, institution called and said, hey, you wanna, not hey, but <laughs> we'd like to offer you a position uh, or a uh, part of cohort uh, for Curtis. And uh, I was definitely, I didn't feel like I was ready to make that next step because I was also very interested in um, education and science and, and didn't really know what I want to do with my life. But uh, my mom said, you know what? Uh, there are times where uh, you choose the path, but there are other times where the path chooses you. So I decided to sort of take that risk. I moved from Toronto to Philly and, and that's when things got really serious in terms of like just developing skills and, and really thinking about like, how is this going to be like a life thing as much as like, uh, you know, something that was great and fun and meaningful in its own way. Uh, so maybe I'll do the next slide if that's okay it's on the Prezi. Uh, so yeah, so this is sort of just what I ended up doing over, you know, this is like a, a big, how can I say, a, a lot of stuff happened in between, uh, but definitely uh, all such honors. So I was definitely, um, happy to be at Curtis. Then I moved on to do my master's at, at Yale School of Music. Uh, around that time, like I joined the Anne Sophie Mutter Foundation, went on tour uh, with her. And then for the summer times, uh, I, I went to the National Arts Center, 
uh, Young Artist Program in Ottawa and the Problem in Music Program in Shelter Island in, in New York. So just a lot of incredible opportunities to be able to grow and, and refine uh, my voice as an artist. We'll go to the next slide. And so what ended up happening, uh, you know, during my time at school and, you know, afterwards following, uh, I was starting to perform just like a lot of uh, people sort of with my experience. So doing, you know, orchestra stuff um, and tamer music. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to play for some world leaders like John Paul II, uh, Dalai Lama, President of the United States, uh, and then started like doing just a ton of, of really special events. I know the Olympics are going on, so I played in the opening ceremonies in Vancouver and all the way back uh, for the Summer Games in, uh, in Athens, Greece. I remember that was a lot of fun too. Uh, so all these incredible opportunities uh, that allowed me to really just uh, share my music and share my gift uh, with, with audiences. And while it was a very meaningful type of, of work, I felt like there was always something missing. As I was just saying before, like I think the path chose me and I didn't really feel like, you know, this was really center, centralized around sort of what I wanted my lifestyle to be. And I think it's important for you all as you sort of continue to sort of uh, go down your education and perform performing craft uh, to know that like performance is not the only thing. And especially if you're like doing a lot of solo work or, or traveling, uh, it's a very different lifestyle. And I was starting to like really sort of feel like being on the road or, or you know, in the air all the time or, or connecting to wonderful audiences, but it didn't really feel like I had a sustained, meaningful relationship with them in a way that I personally felt like was important for me. Uh, so we'll hit the next slide. Excellent. So I, um, oh, can, can we pause it for a sec? Thank you. I uh, went back to Hall of Glorview to play a recital and I was fortunate enough to come across a, a music therapy wing in which uh, music was being used to be able to heal in a very intentional way across, you know, psychosocial perspectives, uh, across like physical domains, and, and music was like this interface of being able to deliver healthcare. I was much more in the sort of performance realm, uh, but at the same time, music was that intersection in this department, and I came across uh, an incredible uh, instrument. Uh, which I'll, I'll sh share a short clip and actually we'll stop it sometime in the middle. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll just tell you or I'll just give a signal uh, when to stop, but that's okay. So let's just start this. Thank you for choosing VMI, Virtual Music Instrument. Virtual Music Instrument uses cutting edge motion detection technology to translate movements into music. The system generates musical sounds from movements interacting with colorful shapes on the screen. When you start the software, it will activate the connected webcam. The webcam captures yourself and your movements related to the shapes you draw on the screen. VMI will interpret the motion and transfer the output to speakers.
stop right there. Thank you. Awesome. So you can really see the um, incredible engagement uh, with this tool. I think what really works about it is that the user can actually see themselves uh, in the screen. And the nice thing about these shapes, you can just see in the freeze frame here, is that you can put the shapes anywhere. So say, for instance, you're, you're a child who has cerebral palsy and, and muscle flexibility is a challenge for you. Uh, what you're going to do is like, say, for instance, put that red star just out of range of the child's flexibility. And if they can hit that star, create some type of musical sound. So you're not doing some type of boring sort of exercise of like, oh, OK, we're just going to uh, you know, go to the gym and rep sort of deal. But you're making music. and uh, this is a tremendously motivating uh, feature to being able to persist um, in a very literal way, uh, in the same way as I knew that music in my life was helping me persist in, in different capacities too. Uh, and you could see some of those kids uh, had profound um, challenges, like some might have only been able, for instance, to like just tilt their head for instance, or, or just move like from here to here. But all of a sudden they had a sense of agency that allowed them to connect not only to the sounds and the music, but to be able to express something in a powerful way uh, to their communities. So I said to myself, this is so fascinating, so incredible. This is like, you know, I was relatively young in my mid twenties at this point and said, like, I wanna sort of explore sort of where we can take this technology uh, within the performance sphere, not only the, the education sphere. So we're gonna flip the slide again. And I had a friend, his name's Eric Kwan, and he was a violinist. Um, I, should, I should even say he is a violinist and uh, he had uh, a virus actually attack his, his body in which he was uh, paralyzed from the neck down. And I said, you know, to Eric, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if like we could get you to be on stage again because he loved playing uh, music. Uh, and how can we use the, the virtual music instrument that you just saw to be able to uh, create the type of music that could actually work within a chamber music or even an orchestral setting. Uh, so this is sort of my first foray into sort of like thinking about innovative programming that was sort of outside of the the classical music realm uh, directly. Uh, and I started an initiative with uh, a team uh, of doctors and researchers uh, and engineers to figure out uh, ways that we could actually uh, bring this instrument to the stage. So I'm gonna share with you uh, on the next clip uh, what we came up with. Let's try the first two variations. Which one would you like to keep, the quarter notes? Oh, let's keep the quarter notes. Okay, so yeah. that was... Is that okay, Eric? I think we're covering you right now. We can't hear any of the counterpoints, so... Too. Why don't we start from there first? And... When I see someone like Eric producing music, and we can react off of that into something completely new in a new territory, well, it makes it fresh again. For me as an artist, it was fascinating to see how technology was married into the aesthetic and music making experience. Yep, yep. Yeah, we're all playing. create music with just the wave of a hand with small gestures or moving your head uh, it was something very powerful. I've learned playing with the violin for about eight years before I got paralyzed. Um, ever since I got paralyzed, I uh, really didn't think that I was able to play an instrument again. Uh, I've never uh, um, done it in the settings like this before, uh, not mentioning being on the stage. Uh, it, it's an incredible feeling. I, uh, it's not something that I thought I would be able to do uh, before the BMI was invented. It's pretty good. Great. Thank you. 
I think that came to together pretty quickly. Yeah. It's nice. Wonderful. So we actually uh, did this debut, uh, oh my goodness, almost, it's 10 years ago now, um, with Eric uh, in the Montreal Chamber Orchestra. And uh, essentially what was happening is we assigned these shapes uh, to various, um, various variations <laughs> of Paca Bell Canon. And, and what we ended up doing is we gave him the freedom to be able to choose and activate loops essentially uh, that could work with the orchestra. The really cool thing was I traveled around the world to collect um, these variations from like, you know, all these uh, soloists around the world like Ansel de Mutter, uh, Pearlman, and they, you know, they would be just like, or, you know, uh, all that fun stuff. Sorry, cellos. <laughs> um, and, and I knew that the technology was relatively limited, but just having Eric up on stage and being able to feel like he was performing for an audience and he had a role uh, to play, that alone uh, was tremendously impactful, not only for him, but the audiences. Uh, so what I always like to say whenever we're on stage, we're also advocates in our own way, just by being who we are and how do we present ourselves and and how do we represent uh, on stage makes a difference in how uh, a narrative of even disability sort of might um, show itself. Uh, so this was like really a turning or an inflection point in my career. I still perform to this day, uh, but it really made me think about like, what can I do uh, within a different sector outside of just classical music alone to be able to create change? Uh, so I actually went back to school. Uh, you can flip the slide. Um, and this is where I uh, went and uh, studied uh, education at Harvard. And uh, my research was based on uh, the use of adapted musical instruments and tools like uh, the virtual music instrument uh, and embedding that within universally designed uh, curriculum for uh, students with disabilities uh, in Boston in particular, and in particular from there, uh, K through five, so young kids. And that was great because then I was able to sort of do a little bit more refined measurements about sort of the efficacy uh, of these instruments and how do we actually place them in uh, inclusive environments. So if we talk about, you know, the, the typical peers uh, such that uh, there's a sense of belonging, there's a sense of agency, there's a sense of, of building empathy, a lot of qualitative uh, data and, and research sort of based upon those, those aspects. Uh, and uh, as I was you know, continuing this work, uh, I was starting my work as uh, an advocate. So really just traveling the world and, and really finding ways that we could just at least open up the idea that, hey, this can be possible. We can create inclusive environments uh, within the orchestral setting if we can, you know, uh, attend to some of this, this work on the front end with the tools, curriculum, teachers, uh, and then spaces uh, that can be uh, accessible. And I, I like the advocacy work because you get to talk about it, you get to share a story, uh, and you can really motivate people around the world uh, to be able to attend to this work. But I was also saying, you know what, I should probably be doing this myself. I can't just talk about it <laughs> sort of deal. So you can flip the slide. Um, so I started sort of my career in formal education. I sort of worked my way from the bottom up. Uh, I started off um, at an El Sistema program, uh, running a, a program of about 420 students, K through eight, uh, sort of getting my feet wet in sort of program management and administration. Uh, and I was very lucky to sort of start off from this vantage point because I had come from like the performing world as a soloist, like how are you going to lead people? And uh, I very fortunate uh, to be able to have that experience for about four years uh, and really thinking about what sustainable programming looked like at the intersection uh, of social justice as well. We all sort of, you know, heard a lot of stories about the El Sistema program increasing uh, the accessibility of education for low income students, for instance, and really thinking about um, music as a, a social galvanizing uh, movement in the end, which had really taken hold, uh, at least uh, around my time uh, in Boston. Uh, so that I did that for a few years. You can flip the slide. And then after that, I, uh, I now chair the uh, 
the music department in Milton Academy. Uh, and I oversee a programming for about a thousand students, kindergarten through 12. Uh, and this is more of a sort of a typical sort of uh, anchor day job that allows me to sort of immerse myself in Boston and administration and program development. Uh, and at the same time, uh, continue to, to oversee staff, faculty, and, and students so that they all have a meaningful experience uh, in, in the work that they do. Uh, you can flip the slide again. So this is sort of where my passion really is, sort of around education. So I am, uh, and I founded the Music Inclusion Program. It's a nonprofit organization that runs out of the Henderson Inclusion School, which is the uh, school that I did my internship at. And uh, it's a small program. We've only been going on for a couple of years right now. Uh, we have 20 students, 50% uh, 50 or, half, uh, 50 or half of them have moderate to severe disabilities. So that ranges from like cerebral palsy, spinal muscular atrophy, Down syndrome, hearing, vision impairments, the autism spectrum. And uh, we're really just creating this, this lab experiment uh, in a way that we can really set kids up uh, to be able to play an orchestra with their typical peers who are the other half. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that uh, in an orchestra, and I think this is a, a Dr. Jose uh, Abreu um, statement, he was in an orchestra, you know, some people have more to give, some people have less to give, but you give all of that. So if you have one child, uh, for instance, who is just playing, you know, a couple notes on an adaptive instrument, but contributing all of that to the larger whole and being at the same level of importance as you know the the kid who's playing the violin or the cello uh, that makes a meaningful difference not only for that child with a disability but also uh, the typical students who might grow up for instance hopefully this is my hope is that when they see an orchestra or think about an orchestra that's like of course there are people who have disabilities uh, of course, there are people who are going to need adaptations and access support supports in order to do this work. Or if they become uh, employers or, or, or leaders within their community, they will have these formative experiences in which they got to see the essential human element of some of these kids and know that, hey, they have something to contribute, something meaningful and profound that I'm learning from, as well as hopefully they are... Um, doing the same as well. So I'm very fortunate to continue running this program. Uh, we're just getting off the ground right now through a lot of grant supports. Uh, I thank the Kennedy Center in particular for really keeping us afloat during these pandemic times. And we've been doing a lot of uh, virtual engagements and, and we'll just see because the best work that we do as you probably do too in orchestras are, are in person. And, uh, and it definitely has been a challenge as like, say for instance, we have low vision students who need guidance around spaces. That's been uh, a real challenge and almost impossible uh, over the past uh, many months. So we're excited to sort of see as things open up in Boston, uh, how we can really get this program uh, moving forward again. Uh, other aspects of of my work are to continue to travel. So I do perform, as I said, like I do typical concerts, I'll play Mozart or like, you know, Beethoven concerto or something like that with an orchestra. But uh, I really love trying to combine uh, advocacy work and, and using my voice in a way that uh, allows me to um, find inspiration and, and learn from other people uh, because I'm still learning and I'm still growing. Uh, in this sphere and space as well. You can flip the um, slide again. So for instance, uh, my burning question is always what is innovation uh, through my travels? And a couple of years ago, I was very fortunate to um, play in uh, Jenin in the West Bank, Palestine, and uh, came across this young girl uh, who you'll see in a sec. Uh, who was drawing as I was playing um, meditation from Thais uh, with her feet. She had lost both of her uh, arms at uh, some point earlier uh, in life due to uh, violence in the area. Uh, so I was very inspired by just like uh, seeing how she got something out of it. So you can play that clip.
Yeah. So. <laughs> Let's see. Flower? What's that? Two hadiyah for a kilo. Wow. What is it? Shajara. Shajara. She, she drew a flower and a tree and a wow. small house. So that was like really cool. And I, you know, I would take, you know, concerts like that over Carnegie anytime for me personally. Um, and, and just to see Farah sort of just like connect to the music in some way, actually um, allowed her to uh, play my instrument uh, with her feet. She was just plucking um, the, the strings with her toes and, and she loved it so much. I was like, okay, we're gonna have to find some way of her to be able to play uh, a string instrument. Uh, so we uh, decided to create another project for her in which like we were like, okay, well, what instrument will work best for her? Um, and we were thinking that if she had to sort of play with her feet, uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. The violin is a little bit too small uh, to be able to sort of manipulate in some way. But we said, hey, what about the cello? Uh, the cello is sort of large enough that like if she were able to use, you know, her toes for what we would do with the left hand, uh, she should be able to like actually sort of make usable notes. We created an adaptation uh, for her foot uh, to be able to uh, bow off of the ground. Uh, so I guess I'll, we'll just play it because I think it's just so inspiring to see her work in progress. So I think that's just uh, incredible. Uh, you can flip the slide, by the way. Um, and just like thinking about, um, you know, this girl who probably would have never had that opportunity to like think about herself as a musician now, she's saying, I am a cellist. I want to travel the world. I want to use this gift uh, to be able to not only create meaning for myself, but, you know, for others as well. Uh, and I think that's tremendously powerful. Um, as we continue to, to do our work around advocacy and, and uh, music and disability, uh, another question that really is on my brain is like, what is excellence and how are we really encouraging uh, young students um, who might be even in high school up to you know, grad school to create this new technology uh, for uh, users with disabilities. Not only is it like a social impact that you're doing, but you're also creating pro uh, products for these uh, users uh, to be able to uh, purchase and, and create business and at the same time uh, just expand sort of our, our realm of music um, for as many people um, as we can. So in the music inclusion program, uh, we had a, a challenge where we had a, a child, his name's Jack, uh, who uh, really loved to play uh, the xylophone. And uh, he used like a brace and sort of a, a metal attachment. And uh, he was trying to hit the keys. And it was a real challenge for him because he's very shaky, doesn't have a lot of control or fine motor in the same ways as, as his peers. Uh, and rather than saying, okay, you can't play the xylophone, maybe we should do something, you know, more practical, um, or maybe not a pitched instrument, for instance, uh, we decided, okay, we're going to start with what the child wants to do and work our way around that. So we actually created a um, sort of a hackathon uh, for my students at Milton Academy to think of a type of adaptation 
uh, that might work best uh, for Jack. So we can play this video right now. Hi, Jack. So essentially what we've done is we've created a xylophone for you that's electronic. So what that means is when you play a key on the xylophone, instead of the xylophone itself making sound, it goes to a computer and then to a speaker, and that speaker makes the same sound your xylophone would make. But what's awesome about making it essentially electronic is that, as you, as you pointed out and as we saw in the video of you playing it, you found it very difficult to not only reach the keys that were far away from you, but also hit as many keys as there are because they're so tight and close together. But when we make it digital, essentially we can make all of your keys bigger. The other thing we did was we made it curved, right? Which meant that even the keys that were on the outsides of the xylophone were still easy for you to reach right in the center here. But you might be wondering, how then, can, if, our key, if our xylophone no longer has as many keys, how can I still play all the notes I want to play? Well, that's what this handy key over here, the shift key does. Essentially, when you press this key, it changes all of these notes to be higher. So essentially, when you play these notes, they make the same sounds that they normally would, but when you press the shift key, it makes the higher sounds on the right side of your xylophone. This is a rough model of what it would look like. And for you, this would probably be a little bit bigger and obviously not made out of cardboard. But what this essentially shows you is how you're going to be able to play all the different notes on here. Then over here, we have the complicated circuitry. And while this isn't exceptionally important, it would take the electrical signals from hitting the different keys and it would send it to the, key, the computer. And once the computer has that information, it talks to the speaker over here and plays the sounds for you. So I am saying, I think this is the best idea ever. Not taking the other ones on to cool, the other ones all cool. I just like this one the best. Mm -hmm. You like the digital xylophone the best because? Because it's like curved so, uh, so it's easier to play it actually. Essentially, it's easier to play. You just said essentially. And I don't know what that means. So please stay with that season because that's below, okay? Bye. Bye. So Jack really likes the digital xylophone. All right. All right. Cool. So uh, we can flip the slide if you want. I think that. Uh, again, this work is so integral, and I hope that if there are some folks who have um, have engineering backgrounds or are thinking to double major in, in the work that you do, you sort of think about like just the tremendous opportunities there might exist in, in um, adaptive tools and, and accessibility tools uh, in relationship to the arts, music therapy, music education, music advocacy. There's, there's so much uh, that I have personally found meaningful in my life that's completely off the concert stage. And as much as I think it is an incredible gift to be able to walk up and, and, and play concerto for instance, this is really the, the heart of my work. I know for instance, that I'm not gonna be playing forever. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, uh, I feel tremendously fortunate to be able to uh, use my gifts outside of the performance realm to be able to uh, make a difference and hopefully just move that cycle around where, you know, my parents' belief in me uh, sort of engendered a, um, how can I say, uh, my uh, story and I hope to propel that uh, for other folks as well. Uh, so we are almost wrapping up here. So I'm just going to do one final slide. Um, and, and just think about these questions and statements uh, from your own lenses. Uh, right now, we are in a world um, you know, that have the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racism. And these are ongoing, uh, you know, systematic problems that intersect with one another and have created inequality, inaccessibility, injustice uh, in a way that I don't think really aligns for where we 
need to be as musicians uh, to really embrace humanity, to embrace the equality of, of our dignity and, and our rights, for instance. Uh, we're also in a space of like misinformation and this polarization of, of opinion. Um, and when we think about, you know, the sy systemic issues that we need to solve, uh, what is a democracy? What is music and citizenship within this framework that allows us to humanize the other, that allows us to use our skills, use our talents in a way that allows us to make social progress as much as it is, you know, celebrating an art form and providing an, uh, uh, a way of thinking that allows us to, to move forward. We have technology that can dehumanize. If you're, <laughs> I, I'm definitely, you know, pray to this as well, like just being on my phone or, or, you know, even in Zoom in this unfortunate, you know, 2D space. Yes, there are elements that help us connect and sometimes uh, it, it makes us not connect to what's really important as well. So what can music do to find humanization? Because I, I, think, for instance, that uh, the violin is also a piece of assistive technology uh, in a sense that um, it's meant to extend the range of the human voice, essentially, through this bow and all these materials. Um, and, and how are we using technology in the same vein that we're not only expanding range and capacity uh, from a physical perspective, but also uh, extending, I believe, the range of the human soul and, and the spirit as well. That's what technology can do. And that's sort of where the arts can really intersect in a way that can be exciting um, based on your interests. So yeah, is music relevant anymore? I think that um, that's a question specifically for classical music as well. Um, and, and my argument for this is that um, as much as we're looking back to the past in sort of a typical conservatory uh, model, which some of you might be engaged in right now, uh, music that is celebrated to this day, music that has lasted, has been music that has disrupted something at some point from the status quo, has shooken us up and really allowed us to see the human experience in a way that is unique and exciting. And I think that's where we need to continue to go as a field and a sector. Uh, how do we, even within a conservatory context, celebrate disruption? How do we continue that disruption in a way that allows us to make manageable, meaningful, and sustainable change? And how do we use our unique gifts in the sphere of interdisciplinary work? Because that's sort of where we're headed now. There are you know, obviously still Renaissance people who know a little bit of everything, but we're also in the sphere right now where we know more and more about less and less. <laughs> and you know this, uh, if you're playing musical instrument, like I could tell you, you know, to, uh, for the rest of the day, the difference between you know, one millimeter on my fingerboard versus another. And, and Yo-Yo Ma actually says this well, it's like he spends an entire lifetime within this geography right here. Well, that's essentially what we're doing, at least as a string instrument or a wind player, it might do the same thing with a, a reed and, and, and yet that's a lifetime's work. And uh, so how we use it, this deep knowledge that we are specializing in, in order to sort of go to the margins and, and find innovation. So for you, it could be music and education like it was for me. For other people, it could be music and neuroscience or psychology or medicine, for instance. Uh, how do you bring the best of yourself and how do we find the courage to be able to take those risks? Because I know, especially at this point in your career, it's about finding a job, making a career, joining orchestra, which is great and, and meaningful and super important. Uh, and at the same time, that's not the end. And in some ways, I would argue it's not why we're here to sort of just create this career. We are blessed with this real opportunity to be able to make a difference and improve um, the functioning of this world. Uh, but it requires risk taking and it requires courage. Um, but 
the work is the courage. Courage is the centralized aspect of the work that we must do uh, in order to make sense of our mistakes, which we make. I make mistakes on this instrument every single day. I've made plenty of mistakes playing for you just now. Um, but how do we make meaning of our successes and our privileges in a way that um, allow us to serve others and benefit mm -hmm. humanity? So if I can leave you with that message alone, I hope that that's something that uh, can be impactful for you as you continue uh, your work in the field and, and uh, as students and professionals. So I wanted to thank you all for listening <laughs> an hour and a half or so presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions on our remaining time together. Uh, but again, thank you for your uh, engagement and I appreciate you all. Are there any questions? I'm going to start with one since I can't, for technical reason, I can't do the Q&A uh, as a panelist, but I have a, a specific question about the, the weight distribution of your bow with the adaptation. Uh, does it change the, like, the pressure point? Uh, yeah, it absolutely does. But I wouldn't be able to sort of specifically tell you where. Obviously, there's a lot more weight down here. Um, and so for me, again, it's sort of like about the sound. So what I'll do, like closer to the tip, for instance, you know, just like how one pronates uh, with their, their index finger, I'll, I'll sort of dig in a little bit using my muscles in a different way. Uh, and I've just developed a, a technique that really is oral more than anything else to sort of think about uh, what the balance is. There are certain like balance points that are obviously a lot easier. Like, you know, the distribution for my spiccato, for instance, the kind of might be a little bit somewhere else, but it's really like, you know, trying to find a good bow that's responsive at the area that feels comfortable for you. Uh, because for me, I don't want to think that, oh, my ideal spot is all of a sudden here and my shoulders raised most of the time because that's not good. Uh, so, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, how do you create a, a sustainable career? Obviously there's sacrifices that will always have to be made when uh, you're sort of contorting and doing your, your job. Yet, how do we do this in a way that's sort of manageable, um, sustainably, and at the same time, I argue, in a way that allows us to keep our brains free from not fighting against our bodies so that we're free to use our imaginations. Thank you very much. Yeah. There is no Q&A question and response from our participants. So I, I completely get that. I know some folks, it's hard to sort of like think about these sort of within the, um, the, the space here, but um, please uh, reach out to me. I can provide some information uh, for those of you who are um, part of this program uh, that we can stay in touch. Um, Let's see, can we talk about some other adaptive technologies that I use? Oh yeah, uh, I'm trying to think if I have anything around here. Uh, well, okay, uh, I have a, a myoelectric arm uh, that just essentially opens and closes, which seems to work uh, pretty well in a pinch, uh, <laughs> a pinch. Um, but that's pretty much about it. When I was younger, I used to use the swimming arm, which is waterproof, which was uh, useful for me as well. Um, but generally, I've been able to navigate most of the world uh, with one hand. Uh, I've been very lucky in a sense that like, there's been very little adaptation required. And I literally was saying it again, sort of like, Maybe the one thing I couldn't do is play the violin, but hey, we already got that done anyways. So it's like, uh, you could really do anything. Um, I used to have an adaptation for uh, lifting weights as well. So that was uh, useful just to work out. And, and I know a lot of younger kids um, are just exploring. So we're very lucky up here in Canada to have an organization called the War Amps, 
of Canada, which is uh, was founded by uh, veterans from the Second and First World Wars, uh, and supporting their prosthetic limbs after the war, uh, they developed a child amputee program, which I was a part of. That. Uh, pays for whatever insurance doesn't pay for artificial limbs. So that allowed me to experiment like with different adaptations uh, without actually having you know, to worry about the, the financial implications. So that's why something like this was possible. We're very lucky uh, in that sense to have an organization like that and, and the healthcare system in Canada to make things like this happen. Uh, how do I balance nonprofit work and making a living for myself? So it takes a lot of time and, and energy to find that correct balance for you. Um, so for me, it's like, it, I'll, I'll say that it takes a while if you're pursuing a passion and a dream for you to actually get paid for it. Uh, and I just say that now some people get lucky and you might be able to, you know, start, you know, pursuing that nonprofit work or, or whatever your dream is to like create, you know, this ultimate programming like artistically that feels aligned to uh, your mission in life. And yet we have to pay bills as <laughs> well. We have to be able to sort of manage, uh, you know, this aspect of surviving. Um, so I'll say that like, it took a long time for me to start this nonprofit work. I wanted to start all the way back, like when I graduated like Yale, essentially. And this was like probably about uh, yeah, 10 years ago, but I had to wait and I had to sort of, as I said in my talk, sort of built, work my way up the system. So all of a sudden, okay, I was like, sort of like a soloist, people know your name. And, and I wanted to work in education, for instance. So I literally went to ed school and then started interning again, unpaid. And, uh, and then, you know, my first, you know, couple jobs uh, in the education field were, you know, not a great salary, <laughs> but it was like something that I said, you know what, if I'm going to gain trust within the system, if I'm going to be working with parents, I'm going to be working within public school education, this is sort of how you pay your dues, knowing that there's a payoff later in a way that a life's mission, and obviously, you know, there's lifestyle choice too, when you're, you know, playing music, you're not going to be, you know, a billionaire, well, some of you might be, I don't know, not me, um, but it's like, how do you sort of transition this work so you can take certain risks, say for instance, by founding a nonprofit and starting to find that space and time to apply for grants such that eventually you make a living through, uh, you know, what your nonprofit is paying yourself, for instance, or if you're fundraising, you know, where is your incoming, income coming from that? How are you balancing that out? Like for me, so as I said, my anchor job is in an independent school. Um, and yes, it's not necessarily completely mission aligned, but it's, just there enough that allows me to take risks in other spaces. And maybe that'll change as, you know, the next five, 10 years sort of progress, the nonprofit work might take off. I might be able to expand some of this programming back into Canada and, and might pursue that a bit more. But um, it really is, yeah, it takes a lot of faith in, in your capacity to know that uh, what you're doing is the right thing to do in order to really start from that ground up and build um, because living for yourself is the survival part, but then actually having a life after that, once you've settled, um, is something that, yeah, we just have to really ask that question all the time. And again, the courage is the work. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if there are no other questions, again, please, um, I'll, I'll leave my information with our, our organizers here at the program. Uh, and yeah, just looking forward to staying in touch. Please follow me on Instagram. I have a pretty visible Instagram account. You'll see a lot of uh, stories of like flowers <laughs> from day to day because I love taking snapshots, but I also uh, do regular updates uh, for the music inclusion program when we're in session and just uh, share some of my playing as, uh, you know, we all continue to do this work collectively. Well, thank you very much, Adrienne. It was really uh, fascinating and congratulations for all your advocacy and contribu social contribution actually, because it's, it's, very, uh, it's very important and you're doing a wonderful job. It's very impressive. So thank you for thank being you so with much. us and sharing your experience and knowledge. And I know that the students have 
Really appreciated your presentation. Thank you. Um, see you next time. All right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.